Bird notes for this episode, take yourself back 30 years. You're a young researcher. You're working in the difficult environment of the Tongan jungle on one of the islands that's difficult to get to. Your subject of study is the Tongan Megapode, a bird that uses volcanoes, geothermal heat, to incubate its eggs. Enjoy the soundscape of Tonga before you meet Anne Gert and hear about her work with the Tongan Megapode. By the way, Zeno Canto, what a fantastic resource. You are hearing the, the calls of the Tongan Megapode and the Tongan Ground Dove and the Tongan Whistler, which may be vaguely familiar to you, reminiscent of the sound of the Australian bit. Stay with me to the end of the episode, because after speaking with Anne, I'll fill you in with what's going to happen. It's an exciting little event for the bird emergency. So I'll let you know about that at the end of the episode and perhaps how you could even be a part of it. I might add, the sound quality at the beginning of the episode was a little bit dodgy, but it did improve, so stay with us. Hello, bird nerds. I'm Grant. I'm a bird nerd. Welcome back to the Bird Emergency, where we get to talk about endangered birds, some of the amazing variety of birds around the world, and the people who study them and help them. And my guest today is Anne Gert. Now, Anne spent time with the Pacific Megapode about 30 years ago discovered some very interesting facts about the Pacific Megapode, which is part of the complex that includes the, what do we call it now? The orange-footed scrub fowl in Australia was the junk, I I think it was called a jungle fowl or something when I was a kid. I Um, think they did call it that at some stage, yeah. The smaller cousin of the brush turkey and the mallee fowl. Yeah. And... Welcome. Welcome to the Bird Emergency. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Now, Anne's book is called Volcanic Adventures in Tonga, Species Conservation on Tin Can Island. And it's just come out. It's only a couple of weeks. So we'll talk about where you can get it. You can actually get a preview chapter now, and we'll talk about that shortly. Shortly. And I really am wanting to know, what was it like doing research on Tonga 30 years ago? Very different to anything I've experienced afterwards. The island we stayed on, so this megapode is related to the brush turkey and malifowl. It's even more closely related to the orange-footed scrapple, which is in Queensland, but it's in and this megapod is the Polynesian official name, and the locals call it Malau. Only lives on one island. At that time, only lived on one island. The island is called Tinko Island, or near Fa'o. And it's really, really remote. I think it's one of the most remote islands in the South Pacific. So, simply just getting there, living there, the only white people among the Tongans, especially there, is a very interesting experience. Not one I would ever admit, but also really hard against the time. Uh, so it took a long time to get established and form one of the locals before we could actually start researching the birds. 
Chris, he is mistreated and lost, by the way, and he's a I've already done an episode on the Palau Megapod. Yeah. And that was that's highly endangered due to a lack of lack of habitat, really, encroachment mm. by mm. people, the growing populations on the Pacific Islands. I imagine it's mm. pretty much the same for that ho- for the whole complex. And um, yeah. invasive species were a major threat. Rats, yes. mice. Yeah. Is that the case with the, the Tongan species? It's actually slightly different. So habitat uh, destruction is not so much an issue. The island where it lives is has really dense rainforest, and it's an it's a volcano, because what this species actually does, it buries its egg into volcanically heated air, soil, and the volcano does the incubation. So that makes it so unique. So this island is a volcano that is basically collapsed, and you have a calder, caldera in the middle with a crater lake. And all around that is very dense rainforest. And the people don't go there that often and they don't cut down that rainforest. They live on the outer slope of the volcano. So habitat destruction is not so much an issue. For that bird, it is the main threats are people actually going to dig up the eggs for their own consumption. Because what these birds do, they lay their eggs all year round in the same locations where they can reach that volcanically heated soil. And so the locals know those locations and they go and dig them up because they're very big eggs and very rich in high in yolk and very good food for the people. That's one of the threats. There are a few uh, feral cats that cause a bit of a problem. And then it's just a general threat of that volcano erupting and causing big destruction there. How catastrophic would it be, in your opinion, for a really large volcanic eruption? Would that just wipe this population out? That could definitely be. There have been eruptions in the past, in 58, and so there were some where out the, part of the outer part of the volcano was destroyed and one village was destroyed. Luckily, nobody died, but people lost all their livelihood and the government actually evacuated the whole island after that. So the people all had to leave and were only allowed 30 years back, 30 years later. So, yeah, that could happen at any time. The volcano is active. There is volcanic activity being recorded by geologists. So that's definitely a threat. Has there been a an insurance population on another island established or attempted to establish? Oh, that's, I'm not going to take too, away too much from my book, but <laughs> that was one of our main missions was to find another volcanic island that is uninhabited and uh, screen that island for its suitability and take some eggs there to start another population. And I'm only saying as much as that we did. Uh, so by me, we, my boyfriend at the time and myself, it was the two of us, we did take some eggs and buried them on this other island called Lati which is a beautiful uninhabited volcano in Tonga. That's, that seemed to have been successful initially, but a recent survey didn't find the birds. So people did go there for three days and tried to play back the calls and they didn't respond. There has also been another translocation by another scientist to another island that's called Fonole, and that population is currently thriving apparently except that island is very volcanic, very active as well. So that could also erupt at any time. I'm perplexed about the machinations you would have to go through to translocate eggs from one island to another of a highly endangered species in another country. Tell me, tell me what were the legal and cultural challenges to do that? So legally, yeah, we had a, we had permits, obviously research permits from the Tongan government to do that. We also had we went to the minister who was responsible for that island and actually got his written permission that we were able to allow use that island for the translocation. That by itself is a whole chapter in my book because dealing with Tongan politicians it takes a long time and a lot of patience. <laughs> But yeah, we did get that permission as well. Really, yes, it changes because these islands are uninhabited. Just getting there, we had to stay on nearby 
coral islands to some fishermen and then, you know, have to help all the local fishermen to take us to these islands and get them helping us. We found, met some amazing Tongans who were really engaged and helped us a lot with that project. It was wonderful. But, yeah, it was a very big challenge. Um, that was one of the reasons why we transplanted eggs in case something did go wrong. It's a bit of a less of a, a dam- uh, bit of less of a damage for the population than many take adult birds. I'm I'm really interested to know what the the science the, and the animal husbandry is about how the birds use the volcano. How is it different to the mound nesting megapodes that we're familiar with? In Australia, but before before we get to that, Anne, how long were you ensconced in Tonga to get this work done? Uh, so seventeen months. It was supposed to be two years, but yeah, we had enough. I must say, after seventeen months, we did achieve something. I think we did a very thorough survey of the status of the bird on the original island. So we used playback methods and went through the whole island and established which habitat they lived in to obtain a good estim- estimate. We got uh, to estimate about 230 pairs of the birds still lived on the island. We did a lot of research on the behavior and the ecology to find out what they were eating and th- their pair bond and how many eggs they laid. So a lot of basic ecology and behavioral ecology to find out the, the requirements that these birds have. And one of the things I I always think about, and it's probably wrong to say that I'm concerned about it, but as a result of the work that you and your partner did, were you able to hand on the baton, so to speak, to someone locally or a, or a new team? of interested people to do ongoing monitoring. Was there a knowledge transfer between yourselves and the local people? That's a very good point. I would say not as much as I would have liked. So the knowledge transfer was through publishing what we've done, but also sending some of that information to the locals on Tonga. We, on that island too, we had very good contacts with the local policemen and we were also, uh, our family was the family of the local chief. So we would get them involved and try to make it clear to them basic things such as not letting their goats roam freely or letting their pigs roam freely where the birds were nesting. So we did convey some of that information. I think it did get passed down. In terms of working with the local government, which is actually 600 kilometres away from that island, so it actually has relatively little influence on what's happening on that small island, that was rather limited. And if you do read my books, we did have, unfortunately, also have some issues with I don't want to go into too much details with another researcher who had his own way of doing things and that hindered our ability to really work a lot with the Tongans apart from our pretty young age. I was only 21 and the project was actually supervised by a German professor who, whose job it would have really been also to help with passing on that information but unfortunately that didn't happen. You mentioned that one of the threats or the, the main predation of the species was people yeah. getting the eggs as a delicacy. Yeah. Was, do you know whether following your work and ongoing work of people, has that practice reduced? It actually has. There have been some recent visits by other scientists to the island for a short time to find out how many of the egg-laying places are still being used. And there was an indication that tradition is starting to really die out a bit. So it's actually really hard work digging up those eggs. They are being laid by the birds up to 1.7 metres deep in the soil. So you have to dig up a burrow. And it's incredibly hot down there because it's volcanically heat 
heat it, apart from the climate outside, which is very close to the equator. So it's really hard and sweaty work dig- digging up those eggs. And a lot of the young people, I don't think, want to do that as much. But then saying that, this COVID restriction recently and isolation, when there's little opportunity for the island to get any supply ships landing there, then that might all go back again to, to unfortunately, to the habits of basic finding food in nature if they can't get enough supply ships to the island. So prior to that potential issue with the COVID restrictions, even though the population was small and and the species is listed as endangered, had it been fairly stable over over time? Not that we know of, no. There there was only one other English, re- we don't know a lot, but there was one other English researcher before us, about 40, 50 years before us, 40 years, I think, and he did find a higher estimate. He had a higher estimate. It's very hard to count the birds, but you can go trying to estimate them by how many places there are where they still lay their eggs by counting the egg-laying burrows. And there was an indication that it had already decreased to the time by when we came, and it seems to have increased, unfortunately, further since we've been there, based on what the few visitors observed have been there since. Tell me more about the actual practice of laying the eggs and maintaining the temperature. One of the things that people might be familiar with, mallee fowls and brush turkeys in Australia, is that the birds monitor the temperature and then scrape away leaf litter or pile it up to maintain the desired temperature using sensory mechanisms in the beak. That's my understanding. In the palate, yes. Yeah. So how does a a bird may do they need to be as active or is the volcanic temperature fairly stable? That's a really good point. So, yeah, all our three Australian species, including the orange-footed scrub fowl in Queensland, they all have mounts. But this bird in Tonga, yes, the temperature is relatively stable. But one of the unique adaptations they also have is that they're very adaptable to different temperatures. So they tolerate a much bigger variation in incubation temperature than, let's say, some other birds. That can range 10, 11 degrees between different eggs in that Tongan bird. But I would say generally the the volcano is pretty stable in terms of temperature. So they don't have that problem of having to maintain a mound. They, but they do have to dig a big burrow and lay their egg down there. That's pretty hard work as well. It's actually in this species, also their egg size is amazing. Like I've mentioned in one of my recent posts on Twitter that in brush turkeys, the egg weighs about 10% of the female body weight. But in this Tongan megapod, it weighs almost a quarter of the female body weight, the egg. So they produce an enormously big egg to make sure that the chicks are really far developed and have a lot of yolk so that they can dig themselves out from these deep burrows underground. So that's their investment. Instead of having to do a lot of digging on the mound, they produce this enormously big egg, the females do, and the males actually hang out with the girls. They are monogamous and they feed them as well. They uh, unearth some food for them so that the females find enough food to produce their big egg. Now, so the male is assisting with with the feeding, with the, uh, for want of a better term, the fattening up for the egg production and egg laying process. Yes. But is it the male that is excavating the uh, the tunnel into the side of the Would volcano? Nice if did. <laughs> so Not the female's doing all the work. She's doing the work. He's guarding her on the outside. He's standing there watching, make sure no predators get her. And he's also defending a territory against other pairs nearby to make sure that nobody eats their food. How does that breeding behaviour compare with? the Australian cousins with the, the orange-footed scrub fowl, mallee fowl and so brush turkey. You'd be, yeah, you'd be surprised how little studied the orange-footed scrub fowl is, even though it's an Australian species, but it's definitely monogamous as well. So it seems to be quite similar. The pairs also defend territories and they have a beautiful duet, a, a song where they 
sing together and they sing join in with each other so i think in terms of the australian species that the scrub fowl is the most similar in terms of mating behavior whereas the brush turkey is a completely different story he's polygonous and polyandrous so lots one boy with several girls and one girl with several boys completely different story now i'm really interested in this idea that the there there can be a stratification, the difference in, in the depth, or perhaps it's not so much depth, but the the distance into uh, uh, the closeness of the ground heat, the source of the ground heat, and ten eleven degrees difference between one egg and another. We know with turtles that temperature can determine the sex of the offspring and it's suspected that some of the some other birds I mean I talked about this with Ricky Coglin the other day maybe scrub wrens fairy wrens that they can determine they can decide sex through some mechanism hmm. does this temperature differential have any determining factor on what the chicks are do we know Good point. We do not know that for the Tongan megapod, but I have actually managed to establish that for the brush turkeys. So if you want to talk brush turkeys, I can tell you more about that. Okay, sure. Let's go down that road. <laughs> Basically, coming back from Tonga, I went back to Austria and finished my degree. And I then met Daryl Jones and had the opportunity to come to Australia and do my PhD on brush turkeys, which was just like, was heaven after working in Tonga, much easier. And so I did study the chicks of the brush turkey and uncovered a lot of eggs. And on one of my work trips up to uh, Queensland, I was up on the Atherton Tablelands and one of the Aboriginal elders there told me this story that they know that after hot years, they have more females running around in brush turkeys and after cold years, more males. And so I thought, wow, that sounds really interesting, might be worth looking into it. So I did incubate the eggs at different temperature and actually found that was the case. So at the average temperature of 34 degrees, that's the average temperature in those brush turkey mounds, uh, the sex ratio of males to females is about 50 to 50. But if you incubate them at a higher temperature, about 36 degrees, you have more females hatching. And at a lower temperature, you have more males hatching. That was quite an amazing result because that hasn't really been known for birds at all. It's different, though, different mechanism than in turtles. Someone else then repeated that study, a lady called Ms. Ivy from University of Queensland. And she actually luckily got the same result, which is always a big uh, good thing when you do research. And she found out that it is uh, sex-biased embryo mortality that's causing that. So basically at high temperature, you have more male embryos dying off in the egg, more male die, eggs die. And at lower temperatures, more female eggs die. And we don't know why. Okay, and do we have any indication that the temp the temperature would stick with brush turkeys? Whether whether there's any indication that the birds are deciding to raise or lower the temperatures? Like I'm, I'm just wondering whether the birds know that there is recruitment of females needed. Do you, do you see where I'm coming? Yeah, I can see absolutely. That would be a logical thing that we could think about, but there's absolutely no indication at this stage. I think the males do have quite a hard job keeping their temperature stable in those mounts. It is so much dependent on outside climate. They don't, they're known when it's raining, they actually, they heap up more material on the top. And actually, they do that before a big rainfall. So some Aboriginal people do think that Ab brush turkeys can predict rainfall. And when it gets hot, they open up that mound to let some of that heat escape and let it cool down a bit. How would so we it's ever... a tricky job, yeah, just keeping the temperature stable. Yes, how would we ever determine that the birds have made a conscious decision <laughs> to recruit more mm. of one sex than another. But mm. there's so much we don't know, so we Sorry. do not understand them. It seems to me 
quite possible that they can sense a pressure change in the weather so that they would, or in the atmosphere, so that they could, Absolutely. That they, yes. they could be well aware. Absolutely. Yeah, a lot of birds can do that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Tell me more about about Tonga. It's one of those places that I've often wanted, thought about yeah. visiting, but it's, yeah. I I would love to go to some remote islands oh, and go a, bird yes. watching it in Tonga. Yeah. What, it's an absolutely be- beautiful place. So tell me your exact questions. <laughs> I'm wondering, it was. have you ever been back for, since you did the work 30 years ago? I haven't actually. No, I haven't been back. I have a lot of very fond memories in my head and I just haven't been able to go back one, maybe one day. It is a very beautiful place. The culture is very different from ours. Uh, Tong people, Tongan people are very friendly and they live very much in the moment. That's a big difference to ours. There's actually that expression of Tongan time, which basically means that you really live in the now and you don't worry much especially about the future. And that can be a great thing. And it's generally, it's, I think it might be the more the common version of mindfulness, possibly. It yeah. sometimes make it a bit tricky working there because the thinking ahead is not so much part of Tongan tradition. And even if they know there's a cyclone starting off the coast of Australia and they know that cyclone is approaching Tonga, they would still not stock up on food because if it hits on a Sunday, that's bad luck. <laughs> So it can make it a bit hard at times, but generally, yeah, definitely a very relaxed approach to life and very different to ours. Now, folks, don't take any of this next part of the discussion as travel advice because it is 30 (laughs) years old, all right? Yes. And if what do you think it would be like for somebody to turn up in Tonga just to go bird watching? How difficult would it be to arrange if you weren't part of a organised research or effort, but just to fly into the international airport at Tonga, get a ride to a hotel, and then start trying to find a way to get to some of the remote islands and tick off some of the endemic mm. local species? Do you already yeah, need a so- network? Oh, yeah, you'd need a network. So, obviously, bird watching on the main islands where tourism is relatively well established, it's not that hard. The, bird, the number of birds are limited for two reasons on those islands, for two reasons. First, because generally, as you, you might know from island biogeography, not many birds actually made it to those Pacific islands. So, it's less than in Australia. And the second reason, there is a problem with introduced species, with rats. And also the Indian miner is actually quite common in Tonga as well, even on the more remote islands. So that's quite a problem. The the remote islands. So most of the islands in Tonga are volcan- are coral islands. So they're flat atolls like we know them, beautiful with a big blue lagoon around. The number of birds in those is often, unless they're uninhabited, also quite limited in terms of that there's not that much habitat. Then we have this chain of volcanic islands. So they're they're the ones that basically one island after the other running from north to south. That also, uh, we talk about the terrible volcanic eruption that happened in Tonga last year. That was one of the islands in that chain. So those islands are generally mostly uninhabited and very hard to get to. And partly is that the coast of those volcanic islands is so rough, you can't land a boat there. So we had to swim to those islands to get to them, or we had to use the skills of very useful, very skillful local fishermen who would move their boat to a rock near the shore just at the right time for us to hop on land or to quickly get the eggs across before the boat would crash on the rocks. And that needs a lot of skill. So it's very hard to land on those islands. And it's uh, that's one of the issues. Uh, but on the other hand, it can be very rewarding if you do manage. I, I believe there are now some tourist operators trying to help people to visit Tofua, which is one of the volcanic islands. So you can get to that one. Uh, Latvia is quite hard to get to. Neofo, where we stay, 
you just have to have a lot of time. Even now, I was reading some uh, comments on the internet by people who visited and they said that you can get stuck there at any time because the connections by plane are very regular and you just don't know when you'll be able to leave again. Um, I'm trying to picture 19-year-old you. 21. <laughs> oh, tw- 21, <laughs> sorry. Such a... Such, such an ad- an adventure, really. Um, yeah. Do you, would you get ethics approval to do that now through the university? I think at the time when we did that, our permits from the Tongan government were regarded as sufficient by the people who supervised us. I assume possibly we would now need ethics permits as well, I would say. Yes, yeah. Not that we tortured the birds in any way. but no, did I, leg, I wasn't leg thinking leg. about the effect on the birds. Sorry, and I, I was yeah. thinking more about the danger to you and your partner no, with getting no, was, off the boats onto no. the rocks. That, that Just the risk factor for yourselves. That was how I was thinking. Yeah, were, that might not pass were. muster nowadays. Possibly not, yeah. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, it was a bit like along the way of the professor found two students who did the project and he sent them there. There wasn't too much <laughs> consideration of safety. <laughs> uh, we were both uh, had a big adventurous spirit and we survived, but it, there was a lot of issues. One interesting issue on that island that I do mention in this podcast because I try to convey that to the locals is there's a big problem with parasites on that island. The story, and I had those parasites, the, pro- the story on that island is it has a crater lake and there was a Catholic priest who decided he wants to get the locals more food. He went to Indonesia and brought back some tilapia fish from Indonesia. Oh. And those, and he only brought back three fish that survived. And those three fish had parasites, so they're liver flukes. They live in those fish and they have a very complicated cycle and they managed to live through that whole cycle in the crater lake. So obviously we didn't know that. And I came back with liver flukes. I was quite sick at the end of, of my stay. And so that's something we're trying to tell the locals again, mess- send that message to them straight away. Don't eat those fish undercooked or raw. They like to eat raw fish. That probably explains why you cut your visit short and... Yeah, I think you should read my book to really understand. <laughs> well, I, 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 I'm, look, I, I'm looking forward to, uh, to to getting it and going through it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm really struck by how different research was back then, like just thinking that you're being supervised by someone in Germany and it's like, all right, yes, you can do that project, off you go. Yeah, we even had to find all our own funds for it. We spent seven months just writing letters to potential sponsors to get enough money for this project. So that was all our job. And so the supervisors, they put their name under it for credibility, but we did all the hard work, really. Can I jump ahead for a bit? Because you mentioned that you you did your PhD with Daryl Jones, Jones. is that right? Now, Daryl, of course, I think we can call him friend of the show. He's been on several times. What drove you to want to do a PhD? I'm always interested in that decision that people take to do it because generally it means another two, three, four, five years of eating two-minute noodles and bumming a ride off friends to go anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. And I might not be the best example for that, just giving the best example answer. I didn't set out to do a PhD. I set out to study megapochics. And the PhD was a side result of that. When I was in Tonga, and we, I just have to tell this story. That's how my fascination started with megapochics. We would go out with this local man who was a local egg digging expert and we would ask him to show us where those laying grounds of the birds were. And he would, we couldn't stop him from digging out the eggs because that was against his tradition. So he would dig out these eggs and he would sit down with his head, sit down in that barrel, one and a half meters deep. And and all of a sudden he would say, wait, I'm like, what's happening now? And he brought up this little flat ball from down there, one and a half meters deep. He had found a chick that had just hatched down in that burrow. 
And so he put it in my hand. And I think that was really the starting moment for me to be just so absolutely fascinated with this bird. Because that bird had just been, you know, covered, uh, uncovered from one and a half meter steps soil and i knew there was nothing known about megapod chicks at all there was nothing known about how do they breathe down there how do they dig themselves out how do they survive without parents what do they need to learn if they have no parents to guide them so there were a lot of topics that could be studied so i did then write my master thesis on that little bit of behavior observations i had on the chicks of the polynesian megapod and I presented that at a conference that Daryl also attended. It was an international animal behavior conference in Vienna. Luckily, it was in Vienna just as we came back from Tonga. And Daryl traveled all the way to there and we met and we had a chat. And he said, basically said, hey, why don't you come to Australia and, and do a milk on brush turkey cheeks? So I eventually managed to do that and eventually managed to get funding for that. So, yeah, the PhD was a side result of that. I didn't. I don't think I would have done a PhD on any other topic. What is it about megapodes that fascinates you? Well, I guess it is the fact that they're so different to other birds. There's no other bird that does not actually sit on its, where the eggs are not incubated by any other bird sitting on it. We've got cuckoos where you, they lay their eggs in, a, in another bird's air nest, a species nest, but these guys are not being incubated at all like in a traditional way. And the young ones really have, don't learn anything from their parents. So they're, we call them super precautious. So they're the most precautious of all birds. And there's so many questions about how does a young bird manage to survive if it has no parents that teaches it anything? And that was basically the basic question behind my PhD. So I did a lot of research on brush turkey cheeks, radio tracking them, how do they survive? And I studied them in big outdoor aviaries to see how they recognize predators and how they recognize each other and lots of topics like that. Share some of the findings from your PhD. Um, lizards, snakes, crocodiles, alligators, turtles, tortoises, all fend for themselves yep. from yep. Wh whether they are egg hatched or live birth. Yes. So are megapodes closer cl it in 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 their relationship to reptiles than than other birds or is, is it yeah. convergent uh, evolution what? yeah it is more convergent evolution so what you just mentioned is what people originally thought they did think they would be closely related to reptiles because of that kind of behavior but uh, that's that's not the case so they are galliforms they belong to the chicken like birds and they have just evolved that as a secondary the thinking is that at some stage they would have left their nest and covered it a little bit with some material and then they realized, okay, eventually we didn't have to incubate those eggs anymore over, over millions of years. So findings for my PhD, level of brush turkey chicks, I did my study in the hinterland of the Sunshine Coast in Queensland and I found that the chicks only really survived well when there was some thicket for them to hide in, like lantana thickets. They didn't survive well in their original rainforest habitat or in suburban areas, so their suburban areas. They, their mortality was really high. I would radio track chicks quite a few times and I would follow the signal into someone's house and I would knock on the door and I would say, oh, do you, excuse me, do you have a cat? And the people would say, oh, yeah, we've got a cat, but she never kills any birds. And then I would say, I'm yeah. sorry, I'm getting your signal. And I'd walk in and there was the bloody chick on the carpet somewhere. So, yeah, cats do kill a lot of brush turkey chicks. And also some of them are killed by birds of prey and some by snakes as well. That's the main predators. In terms of behavior, I built this big outdoor aviary. And I actually trained, I had a pulley system and I trained a cat and a dog to walk through the aviary on a leash through the, along that pulley system. So the chicks were just walking around in there and I could observe how did they respond to those predators. I also pulled a big rubber snake through it and I had a, another pulley system where I would fly a silhouette of a bird of prey overhead. And I found that the chicks did respond properly to 
those predators, like when the bird of prey flew overhead, they would duck down. When the dog approached, they would actually run away. With the snake, they were, oh, they weren't that worried about it. They would run away at some stage. But with the cat, they behaved completely the wrong way. They would just duck down and basically would have waited until the cat would have been close enough to catch it if that cat had been able to do that. So that showed me that they don't have any adaptation to an introduced predator like that. And that might be an explanation why so many of them get killed by cats. Are you aware of anybody who has followed on from that work and researched cats and brushed turkeys further? Did I know? That would be a good topic to study, how many are actually getting killed. But yeah, hmm. but we, we know in Australia cats cause a lot of damage. Right. And whether brush turkeys are so well adapted in parts of urban Australia now, whether the mortality rate is different, whether there may be... Yeah, that could be a good point. Yeah, absolutely. And we do know that once these chicks now in suburbia, once they learn that there's food up, they come out from their hiding spots pretty early on and walk around and you can actually observe chicks quite frequently now in even suburban Sydney and Brisbane and so on. Yeah, of course, we uh, before yeah. we started uh, before we with started, the go button, we were talking about button. Matt Hall and his, uh, his work. Yeah, uh, I'm, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated to go back and read your paper now, and I'm really <laughs> interested in, 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 in the methodology and what, what you found out, and hmm. so interested to know what what people are working on in, in all the megapodes now. Uh, yeah, you, yeah. You're doing some work assisting the Malifowl recovery team. Now. Yeah, I'm only, only just starting that. So the Malifowl recovery team is doing a wonderful job trying to obtain grants and coordinate monitoring and recovery efforts for the Malifowl, which we all know is in, in a pretty dire state and really needs urgent help. A lot of threats bearing down in Malifowl, habitat destruction, fires, foxes, a lot of different issues there. So I'm just starting to help them a little bit, trying to get some more funding for Malifowl recovery action. There's been an updated national Malifowl recovery plan that has been released by the federal government and that was up for public comments until late February. So I think those are now being incorporated and once that's finalised, we can really say these are the actions that are recommended in that recovery plan and really trying to fund those. Now, I hope I'll be talking about the the plan when it's released, but yeah. but you're, you, we, you've just told us that you're not doing any academic work on the, on the Mali Fowl, but I'm interested to share with people who may not be aware so much of the Mali fowl. And what, in general terms, you mentioned habitat reduction, you mentioned foxes as, and fire, but the Mali fowl is really widespread over the drier yes. parts the, of Australia. Yes. Are there different preva prevailing threats? I probably picked the wrong word there. In different parts of the country, is it the fox more in some parts? Is fire more of a risk? Is habitat yeah. re reduction more of a risk in different parts of the country? Can you give us just a brief rundown of the threats like, of the I can't do that yet. Yeah, I can't do that yet geographically. I'm not familiar yet enough what's happening there, but that's definitely the case. So you you have areas, you have to think of the Malifowl as a really unique breeding strategy too. So while the brush turkey has all this wonderful leaf litter to build with and actually build a mound, for the Malifowl it's actually much harder. It lives in these arid zones where you have a lot of sand. So they build a mound that is largely sand and then they in the middle have a little chamber and they dig together whatever leaf litter they can find to make that little chamber of a temperature where that leaf litter can decompose because it's the decomposition that produces that heat. So for the Malifowl in some areas, if there's not enough leaf litter, that produce, not enough crops to produce that leaf litter, that is definitely an issue. 
fire in general if it reduces the food availability for them. We just heard they they produce very large eggs, megapoles, to produce those super precocial chicks. So they need a lot of protein food. So if the whole ecosystem is disturbed and they don't find enough protein in vertebrates to eat and seeds as well, that's causing a lot of issues as well. Foxes in some areas obviously worse than in others, though there is some contradicting results on how much damage foxes really do. They have tried to, in some areas, do intensive fox baiting, and it still didn't make a big difference because ecosystems are really complicated. So if you take out the foxes, it might mean that there's more cats afterwards that then kill the brush chickens because the foxes no longer kill the cats. Or they might be, they might have done some of those studies at the time when the rabbit calci virus was released. So there were less cal- rabbits, and then the foxes would eat more mallefowl instead. So the whole approach has to be from an ecosystem perspective to really look at what's causing that decline in mallefowl. Has anyone repeated your your predator work that you did with the brush turkeys on the mallefowl? I believe that, yeah, there have been studies radio tracking chicks and there was, it was evident that if, if they are being killed, it is foxes is one of the main predators for them, but also cats and some birds of prey as well. Where's the mallee fowl big aviary <laughs> where someone's been dragging, uh, dragging snakes through? I'd like to, I'd like to see that, yeah. Anne. Yeah, the brush turkey one, yes. <laughs> yeah, the oh, mallee fowl does really well in those big enclosed areas that are now declared conservation areas where they're really fenced in, and that's an indication that obviously predator uh, removal does help that species, is definitely. Now, when we have a conversation like this, I'll, I'll often ask people what's next for them with their research, but... You're totally out of that, uh, out of that world now. Anna. Yeah. Uh, but, yes, I am. I have tried to establish a bit of an academic career with brush turkeys for quite some years. I like telling the story. I had an interview for a lectureship at a local university, and I didn't get the lectureship because the competing applicant he was studying fruit flies, and fruit flies are much more important to the economy. So I couldn't really compete with my brush turkeys. It was really hard to get research funding for that kind of work. Generally in Australia, doing any kind of more natural history-based work is really hard to fund if it doesn't have any benefit for the economy. So I did then leave academia and I worked as a threatened species officer for the New South Wales government, working, building, writing recovery plans for endangered species of all sorts. I've worked in that position for quite some years and now I've changed to do high school teaching in science and trying to enthuse some young people about conservation and nature. With New South Wales, were you working in the Saving Our Species program? That was before that was established. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Jeez, that's, um, yeah. So I'll back. Uh, j- just generally, let's have a little bit of a conversation. Yes about getting funding for research because I think a lot of people who listen to the podcast might not understand how cutthroat it is. You, you've mentioned that funding often goes to a sector of the economy where it's seen to be a greater economic driver. So we always hear about medical funding, medical research, agriculture, hearing and technology affecting mining is often a big winner. But even the money that's set aside to go to the life sciences, ecology and allied fields, that's competitive, isn't it? Everyone's submitting applications to compete against each other. So some of my favourite researchers... They're going to, someone's going to win and the others are going to lose. Yeah, Yeah, it's very sad. (laughs) This is obviously just my personal experience, but it is very competitive. And at the time when I was doing a lot of my grant writing, it is your, your verse is counted a lot in the number of publications that you can present and also how many people cite those present, those publications. 
So again, if you work on a species that is that a lot of other species, a lot of other people work on, they keep citing each other because their papers are relevant for each other. I had nobody else in Australia studying brush turkeys apart from Daryl Jones and myself. Matt Hall wasn't on the board then yet. So nobody would, not that many, some of my papers would be st- uh, cited because they were of general interest about how species birds recognize predators and, and they each other but it is a much lo- at a lo- lower level and so you already have a bad start if you're starting studying a species that is not as often cited as others i believe it has possibly changed slightly now that citation index is not quite worth as much as i said i have been out of academia for a while so i might not be the best person to judge that but it is definitely still important I I hope I got this figure right, but I think in the Australia Research Council grants, they're the main big ticket grants that are allocated yeah. annually. Now, yeah. I think was it last year out of 500 that three of them went to what you could call ecology mm. projects? Wouldn't so surprise. I've, I think that was the number. Please let me know if I'm wrong. But I just want people who are not in academia to understand and why I'm always banging on about money and why I'm always banging on about well, governments need to get serious and people need to talk about these issues. When we talk about we've got to save the planet, we've got to protect our species, we've got to protect biodiversity. It's fine to have a slogan, but if there's no money behind the slogan, it's just hot air, empty gestures. Yeah. What a lot of people outside academia don't understand is they think people have a job. You have a job as a lecturer in ecology or whatever field. And they think that should enable you to then go and do the research. But that's not the case. The research costs money. You need money for field equipment. You need money to buy, sometimes have assistance and so on, so that your job doesn't pay for that. So all researchers have to still apply for external grants to actually do their work. And that's where often what the bottleneck is. And you've got to maintain maybe you're doing 15 hours teaching and then you're doing three, five, ten hours marking and then you're doing your office hours for consultation, there isn't the time to go out and do physically do the work to collect the data. And as we – I talked to somebody recently when we were talking about tracking seabirds and I think one of the data loggers that they were using was 3000 bucks, and they needed a 100 of them. Yeah, that's not small change. No, yeah, yeah. And part of the other problem, again, I don't want to be all doom and gloom, but people will always come back to me and say, "But there's all these foundations that can help." Now, there's all these foundations. If you go to them and they've never heard of the bird that you want to study, or the location, perhaps the particular vegetation community or something, and you're not getting cited and you've never presented at one of the major conferences, they'll go, oh, thanks so much for your application. And then be already with a profile and already with probably with some a track record of attracting money, gets the next lot of money. That's very, yeah. And I only bring it up all the time, Anne, is because to me the heroes in conservation are not the Bindi Irwins, I've got nothing against Bindi, but it's the people who don't buy a new vehicle because they've been getting 20 grand each year for three years to undertake a PhD on a remote island subspecies of an endangered bird, plant, reptile or mammal. They're my heroes. And it is often the PhD students or the master students who do that kind of work. Who just say they need to get data, and that's their only payment, really, is to get the data to finish their thesis. Yep, yep. And that's a big. Uh, it's a big commitment in time, but they give up a lot. The opportunity cost for not going and learning how to be a social media manager is to not do 
communications in 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 science or something. It's they're my heroes. Oh, they really are my heroes. Love them. Support them all. Dead, absolutely, they are fantastic people. And then you do your PhD, and then what do you have to do, Anne? I'm trying to get a job at the university. Good luck. Yeah, or, <laughs> or, or get another grant, or right? even if you get a job. And this is the other thing too, mm-hmm. and the hidden thing. Again, people think, oh yeah, you, you read the footer in the email, lecture in something at somewhere, but they might be again on a three-year postgrad. They got a job for three years. <laughs> They haven't got. Mm. It's not like the old days where where the crusty economics statistics professor has been in the same office, avoiding teaching classes for thirty five years. Those days are gone. Yeah. yeah, I have been in academia and had many friends, and some of them managed to really establish themselves eventually in academic jobs and are really happy in their job because they do what they really enjoy doing. But what you have to be prepared to do is to travel. You have to be, like you said, travel to a new job and it might be a completely different country every three years. That's what I did for many years until I had enough of it. Uh, so you have to be prepared to, to do that until you really can settle down somewhere and that's a that's commitment to so on. And, and another thing that confronts these people, you bring up travel. So we get people come in from all over the world to do maybe a two, three, five year program. And then they've got to negotiate the immigration system. Yeah. Because you don't want to buy a house or decide to have kids if you can't get PR or citizenship. So yeah. it's very fraught. It's very fraught. <laughs> yeah. You actually have to leave the country the moment you submit, the same day you submit your PhD. Is, is that right? Is that still the rule? was the case for me, yeah. So I just left my PhD lying around for a little while. I didn't submit it. <laughs> for as long as you could. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, wow. Look, I used to do a podcast on migration to Australia with a, with a migration expert. I did not mm-hmm. know that detail. I did not know that when you had submitted your PhD, you had to leave. Yeah, your student wow. visa expires straight away. <laughs> Really, oh, yeah, wow. So, and what are you doing for a crust these days? All right, okay. Yeah, like I said, I changed. I did another degree, doing a teaching degree, but even though I had university teaching experience, I wasn't allowed to teach in high schools. So I did a graduate diploma in education and now work as a high school science teacher. And I'm very happy in that job. What's the best thing about teaching kids? The enthusiasm they often still have and you're trying to – and to, the, still that believing in, in wonders really that happening and being amazed by things. So that's often – that disappears the older they get, but just still able to instill some fascination into them and also still the believing that you can do something about some of the current issues we have and trying to talk to them about what we can do as in, individually. Any of your students doing the school strikes on Fridays? Oh, I, I don't want to go into that. <laughs> I don't think my school would want me to either promote or not promote that. <laughs> All right. It's my show and I'm going to say those kids are also heroes. I love it. I love seeing the the signs being held up and the posts on Twitter. I love it. I love activist kids. Good on them. Uh, and amongst the kids that you have been teaching in recent years, are you seeing any bird nerds? Oh, yeah, there are the old bird nerds here and there. Or I would uh, I would go on a little camp with them and I would show them. I would get my little my phone out and play some calls and all the little were they scrub friends. They would all come down and see, we might see five or ten and then they would go back to their group and I would tell the others, we saw hundreds of birds. <laughs> so they're fascinated. They love, they love. A lot of them have never seen birds up close and so that's a really nice thing to do. Now, I don't want you to give away pigs, but what what region are you working on? Which scrub wrens are people seeing? 
So that was in the uh, scrub. They were the white grout scrub ones, I think, and that was in the Southern Highlands, I believe. <laughs> That would be the best scrub wren to be introduced to, I think. Yeah. No, uh, no doubt about it. Uh, yeah. And tell us where people can get a hold of the book. I mentioned that there is an introductory chapter that's available, and I'll leave yeah. the link. We've got to do the doobly do, so it'll be in the right. description and on, on the webpage. But what's yeah. the easiest yeah. way for people to order the book? That really depends which country you're listening from. So in Australia, it is sold by Amazon. It's also sold by Booktopia and by Dimux. I would appreciate if you could maybe just put the ISBN number available for people. The best thing is to Google the ISBN number and find the best deal in your country. It is available for more major retailers, but how the prices different differ, that really changes from day to day. Best to just Google either the title, the title is uh, Volcanic Adventures in Tonga, or Google the ISBN and, and try to find the best price. And that's as a paperback and as an ebook. it is also available from Amazon and also from the publisher, which is Austin Macaulay in the UK. And what I might do, Anne, is I might create a, an image with the ISBN in there, a nice size, so that people can print it out and they can then mm -hmm. take it to their local bookshop if they want to yep, support their local bookshop yep. and their yep. local library and say, yep. could you order this book, please? No, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, and as I said, I have put up also, I've got a Facebook page. There's a link on there to a just a free first chapter. So you can download the first chapter for free and just get a bit of a feeling what the book's about. And is there anything else we need to say about Megapose? Oh, I do have an, another question, and it's about evolution, and it's about the Pacific Megapode group. Right. How long do you think the Tongan – now, is it a species or a subspecies? Let's get that it clear. Is, yeah, it's a Poly Polynesian megapod. It is, it is a species, yeah. But, it, but is the Tongan population a separate species? Yeah, it's called yes. megapod. Yes, okay, okay. So, so how long have they been isolated, do you think, from the Palau and – I think there's mm. four, th there's three or four more, I think, aren't there? So. That's a good question. There is a scientist who is a paleontologist, and he, Dave Steadman, he went to a lot of these islands and dug up bones of birds, from you know, fossil bones, and he found that these birds used to occur on many more islands in the past than where they are now. So that was one of our justifications to translocate them to other islands too. And he also showed that, yes, they seem to, during glacier times, during ice ages, they, when there were more islands present, seem to have hopped, basically, island hopped from one to the other. So it seems to be maybe the last ice age when they've been after that, when they've been separated from the other species. Excuse me, that they are quite closely still related to. That's about the time frame we're looking at, yeah. Yeah, that's the paleontology part. And you asked me what else to mention about megapods. Definitely want to thank Daryl Jones for being doing all the groundbreaking work with brush turkeys for so many years. He did fantastic studies into the whole mating system and the ecology of adult brush turkeys. And I was really grateful he enabled me to continue working with them with the chicks later. And yeah, Matt Hall is doing a great job as well. But I think we're about the, the only brush turkey researchers in Australia that I know. <laughs> Can the Pacific Megapode swim? No, not that I know of. So I think the way these birds reached the islands was via islands that have now submerged. So there were more islands present. They were like stepping stones. And they, the chicks can actually fly quite well. So I think it's often the chicks that are the ones who venture to new areas. And that's also the case with brush turkeys. They, the chicks can actually fly quite well. Now, that's a very subjective term for a scientist, Anne. Quite well. How far can a megapode chick fly? Oh, you, you don't, once they fly off, you obviously can't follow them, but I have, <laughs> in, with radio tracking, they've been changed. They would have uh, covered a distance of 500 metres in a pretty short time, I radio tracked them. So that for a little chick of that size, that's yeah, a pretty yeah. good flight, first yeah. flight, yeah. Yeah, 
that, mm. that is all, all. And then there, there are some some anecdotal stories of chicks of orange-footed scrub fowl landing on boats off the coast of Queensland. So they would have somehow went into the wrong direction and landed there. It was where I was going to go about how that that travel could have occurred. Mm. Could they be landing on after cyclones when there's flotsam yeah. and jetsam being mm. washed off islands? Yeah. Could they have found themselves on something that goes onto another island? Uh, Absolutely. They could have used some rafts of some sorts. That's how a lot of lizards and actually land mammals as well manage to get to these islands. And it's really a pure chance sometimes. So actually, I start off my book in the first chapter. I write about how fascinated I am by island biogeography because it is so determined by chance. And for me, when I was 21, life was all about chance. So I just like like that uh, similarity. <laughs> yeah. And we'll just give people a, a moment if they would like to submit a question or make a comment, they can. Yep. Where have we got? I think we, we had some Facebook and some YouTube and some Twitch before. Where have we got? Twitch and YouTube. Uh, come on with a question if you like. If you do ask a question, let us know where you're listening from. Be very interested to know who's interested in the in the megapodes of the Pacific. I was fascinated to know, and that the it was only the geothermal heat that was doing the incubation. I thought there would be a combination of some decomposing vegetation, some kind hmm. of hybrid method with the... Hmm. Uh, there are actually some other, in this Tongan megapod, it's really just geothermal, but they are closely related ones. On the, in Palau, for example, there's some, and so they also bury their eggs in tree stumps that are rotting. Yeah. So they are using rotting vegetation. On the, some of the Solomon Island species, they use the, the heat from the solar heat as well. So that the sun heating beaches as well, and they bury their eggs there. So it can sometimes be a bit of a combination of different heat sources. I wonder if they were translocated from, from Ireland to these different populations, yeah. whether they could adapt to use the mm. new method. I wonder if it's a, a, an innate skill and they just mm. use whatever heat source is available to them. Yeah. One of the questions talking about that was we also had was when we decided to translocate eggs instead of chicks or adults is in turtles we know that they imprint on the place where they're hatching and they come back to lay their eggs. We didn't know whether that would also be the case in megapodes. So if we translocate an adult megapode somewhere, would it still be able to find a new incubation site that it hadn't hatched from? So that's why we used eggs so that the chicks would hatch on the island and then have the ability to come back to that same location. Looks like I'm getting on Google Scholar later on and looking up some of the uh, more recent work on megapodes. That topic really fascinates me. Yeah. Has there? Are you aware of any more recent work about imprinting? Uh, they have. Oh, you mean on? No, no nothing imprinting on at all. No, there have been all the studies on megapods because they are often in such remote locations. There's little studies in Palau, New Guinea, Solomon Islands, but they often focus more on trying to preserve the egg listing sites and working with the locals. They're not an easy species, a group of birds to study if you don't live in suburban Sydney and can observe brush eggs in your backyard. No, but totally fascinating. And now I've just made myself a note, more megapodes. So Google Scholar, here we come. Yeah, I regularly give talks for local councils in Sydney about brush turkeys with the purpose of educating people who are often very much against these birds. Because, And that's very understandably because they build, have a beautiful garden and then overnight this bird w walks in and digs up the whole garden, including the sprinkler system and everything in one big mound. And, and that's often a lot of money that gets lost there too. So I often try to tell people how lucky they are, though, to observe such fascinating birds in their backyard, but I'm not always successful with that. Are you familiar with the photo that Matt Hall shared with me for the last time we, we spoke to Matt of the child's play set with the swing? So it was the combo 
play right. set. And, and and the brush turkey had totally covered up most of it up to the height of the <laughs> of the slide up to the buried most right. of the slide. Yeah, <laughs> yes. I have a photo. I used to have a photo of a, a cemetery where there would be just this gravestones, low gravestones on the ground, and the brush turkey had covered all of those, so they they weren't very happy with that either. Yeah, I could imagine people would be upset with that. Just following up on, on those talks that you give with some of the local councils, are you finding that attitudes are shifting or softening towards? Yeah, I think so. That's what the council bush care officers often tell me. That's why they want me to come back because they find they're getting so many complaints and people often just don't know anything about these birds, especially in Sydney where they're just invading as people call it new suburbs but what they're really doing is they're reclaiming where they used to be hundreds of years ago and so people are often flabbergasted what is this big bird that comes into my backyard and causes all this damage and yeah it's good to see some shift in people's attitudes sometimes urban brush turkeys often <laughs> seem to me to be doing this a strut that they're they're very confident birds that strut. How about the Pacific <laughs> Megapode? Does it scut a strut or does it scoot or scurry or stroll? <laughs> Well, they're very shy because people hunt them, so you'd be lucky to observe them for more than a few seconds. And no, I think it would just, they walk together as a pair and and trying to get their food. They scratch and run. That's what they do naturally. uh, Anthropomorphize. I'll assume that they stroll. They're out for it. Maybe. Let's see. Yeah. Very good. And Gert, it's been a pleasure to meet you. I hope we can find a reason to to talk again. All right. Yeah, we'll have to hopefully to help get some more people involved with Malifowl work and talk about that. That would be good. Yeah, and perhaps the next time I get Daryl on for a yeah uh, for a chat about urban birds, hopefully yeah, uh, hopefully we can find a time that that will that would suit you i'd love to to get you back on talking we can't we yeah. can't talk enough megapodes can we really in this country yeah yeah and of course anybody who has got any ideas how to find new funding sources for malifow that would be the best outcome from this from this talk for me altogether. yeah uh, actually if you're one of australia's five or ten richest yeah. individuals or companies and uh, and you're doing so well not paying any tax, how about you fling some money into studying? They are fascinating and they're unique. Yeah. you probably find a way to make it tax deductible. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Good on you. Thanks so much, yeah. and It's been great to meet you. Of course, check out the links, which will be uh, there, where you can search the ISBN. And I'll just search the title, yeah, Volcanic yep, yep. Adventures in Tonga, all, yeah. All, all of that stuff, and I'll have the link yep. to get the introductory chapter hmm. and some cool photos of Anne, 21-year-old Anne, <laughs> doing work yeah. and some, uh, you were, were probably, what, 25 or something where you were holding brush turkeys, some of those older photos. Something like that, yes. Yeah. I want to go into detail, but that's a few years ago, yeah. Yeah, It's great. And I wish you well in your shaping and moulding and educating the future leaders uh, of this country. (laughs) And all the best success with the book. This has been The Bird Emergency. I'm Grant. I'm a bird nerd. Okay, so here's the news. I'll be joining Millie Formby on quite a large part of her journey of her wing threads microlight flight around Australia. I'm going to pick up with Millie in Rockhampton and accompany her as her ground crew all the way to Darwin. Now, it's a bit hard to work out exactly how long that's going to be, but it might be might be a month, six weeks. I'm looking into how I can take the internet with me so we're looking into that hopefully i'll be able to keep updating first seen and heard in the morning telling you the first bird that i see and hear each day 
and that'll be fun because it's going to be different from my usual suspects here in Melbourne. But while I'm away, there will be episodes of The Bird Emergency. I've been storing some up and a lot of bonus episodes. You'll probably hear a lot of Holly. Um, so there will be plenty of episodes. But I'm going to try and do episodes along the way. I am going to take all of my gear with me. So hopefully I'll be giving you uh, interviews with impressive bird nerds and conservationists that will be on any part of that road that Millie and I are tracking as part of her shorebirds awareness flight around Australia. So look out for that. Now, if you want to, if you want to kind of be part of it and help out, thebirdemergency.com slash join, you could actually defray some of the travel costs and maybe help me invest in some equipment which would make the journey uh, a bit easier and perhaps help us take a bit more technology with us. But anyway, that's up to you. Just an option. But things will be a little bit different from, uh, from the middle of May onward. And I'm really looking forward to it. See you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. <clears throat>